When we think about the 1920s, we often think of them as, well, roaring. Glam parties, flappers, a secret entrance to a speakeasy, throwing shirts at the woman you've lusted after for years, all spurned on by the 18th Amendment prohibition. But what we often overlook is the fact that the 20s were a dangerous time to be alive. The government required that all industrial alcohols, the stuff that bootleggers would use to make hooch, had to contain extra dangerous chemicals, hoping to deter people from an illegal drink. What actually happened was the government was complicit in killing a lot of its citizens. Couple that with the increased deaths from the recently popular automobile, and the mob violence coming from racketeers, and yet a lot of new ways to kick the bucket during this era. Which is why the tale of Iron Mike Molloy, the man who refused to die, is still told to this day. Hi there, I'm Alec Belmore, and you're watching History and Intrigue. After the market crashed in 1929, Prohibition was still in effect, so things sucked and you still couldn't have a legal beer. Although the 18th Amendment was replaced by the 21st Amendment in 1933, it was still in limbo until three-fourths of the states approved it. And things were hard, even if you ran a speakeasy. On 3rd Avenue in the Bronx, there sat a little store, conspicuously not open during the day, its windows cluttered with cardboard boxes. But at night, this place turned into a modest bar run by a man named Tony Marino. One night, Tony and his friends, the bartender Red Murphy, the local funeral home director Francis Frank Pasqua, and a fruit vendor Daniel Kreisberg, My cabbages! were all sitting around playing cards and talking about how difficult things were. They fantasized about how nice it would be to have a wealthy relative kick the bucket, or at least one with a decent life insurance policy. That would make life so much easier. Enter Mike Malloy, an Irish immigrant who was basically homeless and who frequented the bar. Malloy had fallen on tough times. He couldn't really lock down a job. Sometimes he was a street cleaner, sometimes he was a coffin polisher, and most of the time he couldn't pay his tab at the bar. So the group, later known as the Murder Trust by the press, thought, hey, here's a guy that no one would miss. They took not one, but three life insurance policies out on Malloy with his consent, being extremely trusting and willing to do anything for the guys who aided his alcohol dependency. He didn't see this as an ominous sign of things to come. Marino also gave Malloy an unlimited bar tab in hopes that he would drink himself to an early grave. And it wouldn't be out of the question, bootlegged alcohol was making people drop left and right. But after two weeks of unlimited drinking, Malloy was thriving. He even looked a little healthier. So Marino mixed him a cocktail made with methyl alcohol, which could be extremely poisonous. Malloy downed the drink and asked for another. No effect. Believing his tolerance was too high because of his drinking habits, the murder trust tried a different approach. They fed him a sandwich filled with rotten sardines, ground glass, and metal shavings. He survived. He also survived oysters marinated in wood alcohol, which was again very poisonous. So they went back to the drawing board. They got him so drunk that he passed out at the bar, dragged him out into the street on a particularly frigid night, and poured water over him, thinking he would die from exposure during the night. However, the cold had roused the old drunkard, and he managed to find a warm place to dry out for the night. The gang was beginning to feel a little frustrated with this man who simply wouldn't die, so they brought in an additional person to get the job done, a cab driver named Hershey Green. They hired Green to drive over Malloy, who they assured would be passed out in the street at an agreed-upon time. The payout was $150, when the insurance money came through, of course. As promised, they dragged Malloy out into the street after he passed out in the bar one night, and Green hit him with his cab. Game over. Or so they thought. A few weeks later, Malloy stumbled back into the bar. He'd been hit by a car, he said, and had been in the hospital. Now, this is unfortunately where things get grim, so I'll try and speed through this as fast as I can. The murder trust was fed up with this Irish superhuman, and in what would be their last and ultimately successful murder attempt, they got him so drunk that he passed out and carried him to a boarding house nearby. 
In a private room, they attached a rubber hose to the gas valve of a lamp and put it down his throat. He was dead within five minutes. They buried Malloy in a pauper's grave a few days after his death. They had paid off a physician to sign a death certificate saying that Malloy had died of alcohol poisoning. And then they went to collect the insurance money. One of the policies paid out, but the others were suspicious of how quickly the body had been buried. Rumors were starting to spread across the Bronx about Mike the Durable and the men who tried many times to kill him. When a beat cop heard this story, he told a detective who began an investigation. Eventually, the district attorney brought all five men before a grand jury, and the jury returned five first-degree murder charges. Four out of the five men refused to talk, but Green, the cab driver, spilled the beans to have his charge lowered to assault and served a 10-year prison sentence. In June 1934, Tony Marino, Frank Pasqua, Daniel Kreisberg, and Red Murphy were all sent to the electric chair at Sing Sing Prison, bringing a close to the saga of Iron Mike. For what it's worth, I'm against the death penalty. Also, for what it's worth, I'm against people trying to kill other people, especially someone like Mike Malloy. At-risk people, poor people, people with mental health issues, unhoused people, are often the most likely to be mistreated or to be victims of violence. At the same time, they're often the least likely to receive help, especially, say, during a global pandemic, or a recession, or both. Be good to each other out there and make sure you're standing up for other people, even the ones you don't know. Thanks for watching.